Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just thank you for your holy presence, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to call you to come down because you're in us. The Holy Spirit has already come, and he dwells within us, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Those who have become born again, those who have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, who have placed their faith in Christ crucified, they place their faith in what has been provided as the only remedy for man's dilemma, the only remedy for man's problem, Lord God. We thank you for the root and the remedy. Yes. We thank you, Lord God, that we can identify what the root of the problem is, and we can also identify the remedy for the problem. It's the root of David. It's Jesus. Hallelujah. It's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you for it, Lord, and I just thank you, Lord, for giving me a word, Lord. I ask God that you would prepare the heart for the message, and prepare the message for the heart. You know how to do that, and I just thank you, and I believe you, Lord God, that you're doing that even now. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So I wanted to talk to you tonight, or tonight, this morning, about, well, I, I was with uh, Pastor Matt uh, a couple of days ago. We were at a little conference in Baton Rouge, and uh, I kind of gave him the idea that I probably wasn't going to be talking anything about Palm Sunday, but it kind of turned around. So uh, Matthew chapter 21, starting with verse 1, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. And so actually, I really wasn't intending or thinking that it would go like that, but the message that he put in my heart, it actually fits hand in glove with the Palm Sunday concept. And so it goes like this, uh, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. And when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says something to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. Now this took place, that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. And we're going to keep reading, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted upon a donkey, even upon a colt the fall of a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had directed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid on them their garments on which he sat. And most of the multitude spread their garments in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the multitudes going before him and those who followed after were crying out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the multitudes were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And it's very clear, that last verse, what their answer to the question was, that they really didn't understand. They really didn't have the revelation of who Jesus was. I wanted to take a look at verse 13. Let's see. I'm used to the headset. I got a little spoiled. And so uh, I'm sorry. It's actually, uh, it's actually verse 9 where they're crying out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna can be interpreted as save now. They were looking for a king who would come and who would be there and who would deliver them in the here and the now of that day. They wanted right then and right there, they wanted Jesus to exalt himself, to take his rightful place, to take his rightful throne, the throne of David. He was going to step in that seat in that place as king of Israel and then eventually conquer the whole earth. They knew what was to come. They knew what the prophets had foretold. The prophets had said that this was going to happen. 
But what they did not connect with is that there were a lot of other things that the prophets said about the Messiah. There were a lot of other things that the prophets had said about the anointed one that was to come. And he had to go to the cross. He had to die for us. And so it's a focus on what had to happen before his reign. He had to be slain to reign. If Jesus was not first slain and he went to reign before that happening, the ultimate plan and the ultimate purpose of God's heart would not have truly been fulfilled. Because that was the only way, that was the only way for mankind to be restored into fellowship with God. That was the whole purpose and the whole plan. What the first Adam failed to do in the Garden of Eden, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, he prevailed and did do. Amen. He did do when he went to Calvary, when he went to the cross. And so the first Adam was created in perfection. The first Adam was created the Bible says, as a living soul. But the last Adam, he was created perfect as well, but he, he was something different. He was not of the same thing. He was not of the same uh, makeup. He was, he was created as a man, but he was a life-giving spirit. Yeah. You see, the last Adam created the first Adam, a life-giving spirit. And so... What the first Adam was not able to do, he was not able to do what his, he was commanded to do. When he was placed in the garden in Genesis 2.15, in Genesis 2.15, it says that he was to dress and to keep the garden. Uh, I believe the NASB says cultivate. Uh, the King James uses a, another word. But the point is the word keep. He had to keep the garden. Under the definition of keep, it actually means to protect and to save life. What the first Adam did not do, he couldn't even save the life of his own wife. He stood there and he watched her take the fruit from the serpent and bite out of it. And so that he, in return, would follow her footsteps and he would take a bite of it. And then sin would enter the whole world. And so what the first Adam failed to do, the last Adam did prevail to do and is still doing today, is still saving lives. The first Adam could not save the life of his own wife. The last Adam is still saving lives today and is still saving souls. And so what they were looking for when they put him on that cult, what they were looking for was someone to come on this fallen earth and just reign here on this earth as it is. And God's plan is so much greater than that. God's plan is so much bigger than that. God's plan is, no, I want something bigger. I want something better. I want something clean. I want a vessel that is pure. The earth that my son is going to rule on is going to be a clean earth. It's going to be a purged earth. What he's going to have to do one day is he's going to have to cause fire to go across this whole earth. And the Bible says that he is going to, Peter says, he's going to burn up all of the elements. Everything that is in the earth is going to be consumed. Everything, all the metals, all the alloys, all of the wood, all of the stubble, all of uh, every chemical makeup of element that is on this earth is going to be completely burned down. All the soil in the earth that has been soiled with innocent blood, all of that is going to be purged. It's going to be cleansed. It's going to be removed. Every demon spirit, Satan himself, is going to be removed from this earth. He is going to be bound up for a thousand years. He is going to be bound in hell while Christ, the king, the lion king, the lion of Judah, he is going to be the king, not of Jerusalem. Uh, not of just Israel, he's going to be the king of the earth. Yeah. And the Bible says that every king and every other nation is going to stream up to the mountain. The mountain which is going to be called Mount Zion. And that is going to be the mountain that the book of Revelation tells us that New Jerusalem one day is going to descend out of heaven. And it's going to come down and it's going to be situated on top of that mountain, Mount Zion. Are you struggling today? Are you frustrated? Are you beside yourself? Are you disgusted? Are you tired? Are you weary? 
I want to encourage you today and I want to cast some vision out before you today and to remind you of what we're doing this for. The reason that we're in this thing. Jesus Christ had to come to earth. He had to come down so that he could go up yeah. the hill and he could die on the cross so that he could save souls. And I like what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 18. He says, if I go and I rebuild again, the thing that was already destroyed, I am now making myself a transgressor. The sin that we commit, the greatest sin that a believer can commit is the fact that they've already accepted Christ. That's not the sin. That's, that's the part that makes us right. But after receiving Christ, then sometime afterward in our failure, in our struggle, in, in our stumbling, we turn to something else. Come on. We go to some other alternate route or some other system of law, some other system of rules, or some other system of what we think might be redemptive, thinking that that's going to do something for us, and it's not. The same thing that saved us is the very thing that keeps us. Yeah, yeah. If the blood of Jesus Christ was able to wash my sins away when I first came to him, it's the same blood that Jesus shed on the cross is what I need to wash me when I sin and when I stumble now. Amen. I was doing a Bible study offshore this last time that I was out there and we had a guy that was in there, a guest, he's new, he's new to the platform and He's really just one of the guys that comes and does a service for the platform, but he's not going to be there for very long. And he brought a lot of knowledge and wisdom, a lot of good stuff that he had to add. But when, when I was sharing, we were studying the message of what Christ has done for us and how to live for God, how to live a pure and a holy life. It's not sinless perfection. We don't teach and we don't preach that we should be sinless, but we do preach and teach that if we're truly putting our faith in the right place and we truly understand what Christ has done for us in our new covenant with him, that we should be sinning less. That's right. I'm not sinless, but I do sin a lot less right. now that I have revelation, now that I have understanding of what he did for me, and that that's really the place that I need to go when I'm struggling, when I have a problem, and I teach these guys, and I tell them, look, man, you don't need a 20-minute or an hour prayer session. All you need is maybe one or two seconds just to refocus and remember what he did. And then the guy that was in the Bible study, he was saying, yeah, so it just sounds like you're just talking about repentance. I'm not just talking about repentance. Yes, I am talking about repentance, but that's not only. Uh, he said, the scripture says that let us labor that we may enter into that rest. Yes. We can enter into a rest. There's a rest in Christ. There is a rest in what Jesus did for us to where we don't always have to be falling into sin. That's right. We don't always have to let a thought develop and become something more than what it really should be. But rather we can just reposition and refocus and just rest in what he did and watch that thing just fade away. That's right. That's right. And the only reason I can even talk about it, I have experienced that. I do experience that. And I thank God for it. I thank God for that. So their focus was to elevate Jesus in right then and there. They wanted Jesus to take his rightful place. Was it his rightful place? It was. It was his rightful place. But the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. It was not the time. It was not the time. And this kingdom now agenda, it, it's, it's something that's being taught and preached all across not just the United States. It's all across the world now. It's spreading like an infection because that's really what it is. It's a kingdom now mindset thinking that the, we are going to usher the kingdom in before the king comes. Let me tell you something about that. The kingdom will never come before the king first Amen. comes. When the king comes, that's when the kingdom, you'll know it has come. So John the Baptist, he was even questioning it. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, it shows where John the Baptist, he even asked, he says, are you coming? Are you the coming one? Or should we look for another? He was in prison. He was struggling. He was having a rough time. And even he began to question, like, are you going to do it now or what? Like, are you going to just do this thing, Jesus? That was his cousin. He knew him very well. He loved him. They were very close. But even John the Baptist did not fully, fully understand what the plan was. 
Luke 19, 11 talks about how there were those after Jesus was teaching and talking with them. There were those that thought the kingdom would appear immediately in Luke 19, 11. <coughs> it's a kingdom now mindset. Let's go to Matthew chapter four, verses eight through 11. The temptation of Christ. I want to focus more on the third temptation in that encounter. When he goes into the wilderness. Boy, I really did good at this time, huh? It's actually in chapter one. Or no, it is four. Okay. I'm going to get it. Yeah. So there were three times that Satan tempted Jesus. And this is the one, the, the time, it's the third time, the last time that I really want to focus on. He says uh, in Matthew 4, 8, it says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things will I give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. What the devil was doing was he was pushing the kingdom now agenda. He was wanting to take a savior and turn him into a sinner. He was trying to make him feel like Satan could be his father. But I remember another story in another time in scripture where Jesus and went up to a mountain and he took his a few of his disciples with him. And there appeared Elijah and there appeared Moses. And there was the transfiguration where the glory of God was on them. And then the voice comes from out from heaven, the voice of the father. And he says, this is my, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What Satan had attempted to do to make him his own, what Satan had attempted to do to try to reduce him down to a sinner, for him to uh, give in to this temptation. And then what he was doing was he was promising him that he could have all the kingdoms of the earth, but the Father had already promised that to Jesus. But the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. And that was the completely wrong context. Satan was never the one to give him anything. And the earth was still in a fallen state. And Jesus, the worthy one, the worthy Lamb of God, he was to rule and to reign on an earth that was brand new, an earth that was clean, an earth that had been purged of all of the filthiness, purged of all of the unrighteousness that was in it. And then we see it again. Again, after Jesus dies on the cross and he's raised from the dead in Acts chapter 1, it comes up again. The disciples, Acts chapter 1. I'm turning leaves up here. I got away from using, using the, the book Bible and I was using my phone all the time. And I don't know why, but I just really felt like I needed to start getting back to flipping pages again. And it's really been a blessing for that, to do that. And uh, it's, it's making, I don't know, just I feel like it's making me a better student in some ways uh, to do it that way. But he says in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, it says... And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epics. I know King James says seasons, times or seasons, which the father has fixed by his own authority. Again, they're trying to push the kingdom now agenda. They're trying to push it that he can come and he can set up his kingdom now. Why though? Why? I mean, what is the big deal? I mean, Jesus could cleanse the earth while he's ruling on it if he wanted to. What was the big deal? Like, why did this have to happen? It wasn't part of the Father's plan. 2 Peter 3.9 gives us some insight. 2 Peter 3.9 gives us some insight as to why it couldn't happen right then and there. It, it gives us insight as to why Jesus still has not returned. And he still has not set up his kingdom. There are certain things in order that must take place before he can, before he will. And it says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. 
but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. There are too many out there in the world today that still need Jesus. There are too many out there that still don't know him. And earlier in this passage here, they're talking about how they're mocking. And they're mocking because you say that he's coming, but he still hasn't come yet. Like, really? If he's going to come, why hasn't he come yet? You've been saying this for thousands of years. Prophets have been prophesying that Jesus is going to return, that the Messiah is going to come. And he still hasn't come. And this is the answer to that. This is the reason. It's because there's so many that still don't know Jesus. He has been patient because he is loving. It's Patience is a form of love. It's another form of love is what it really is. And so he's given to us justification so that we can move into sanctification so that in the end we can move into glorification. Amen. Justification is what happens when we receive Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus had that conversation with the religious man, Nicodemus, and he told him, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. You must be born again. He stressed it and made it very clear that this was the most important thing. And Nicodemus, one of the most religious men in all of Israel, had no idea what he was talking about. This is not a topic to be taken lightly. This is not something that we should assume or be presumptuous about. We need to know that we are born again. We need to have an assurance and a confidence. We need to know that the Holy Spirit, He's in us and that He has sealed us. That I believe that means He has marked us. When you look up the word seal, it does have that idea that He has marked us. When you look at the same word seal, which is used to mark, uh, to, to seal the 144,000 in the book of Revelation. They're marked. They've been marked for protection. And so when the seal of the Holy Spirit enters in us, it means that we have a mark on us. We are secure in that. We are as eternally secure as we choose to be. We chose to say yes when he called us, and we can choose to walk away, God forbid, but we have that option. And so the justification that we receive from Christ has removed the penalty and the guilt of our sin. And then he wants us to be sanctified. And the sanctification just speaks of how we live for God, how he has broken the power, the power of sin. He has broken the dominion, the domination of sin over our life. He has broken it. It no longer controls us. I told someone offshore uh, that, that was in a, in a bad place in his life. And I told him, I said, man, you don't have to be led around like a dog on a chain. Amen. You don't have to be led around by your sinful nature. Like you really can get victory over it. You can That's get right. victory over it. That's right. And it happened. And now this guy's all over the platform, oh. sharing the gospel, <laughs> sharing the gospel, people getting saved, people coming to the Bible study. He's Amen. bringing them in. Now he's giving the Bible study. He's teaching. Amen. Yeah. I mean, the guy is just completely changed. And so glorification, glorification is the end goal here. Glorification is where God causes us to become like him. Yes. We're already becoming, but in the end, we actually get there. We become like him. We will be as he is. Glorification speaks of the body that he's going to give us when he returns. He is going to give us a new and glorified body. This body is going to be recreated. There are going to be some elements in this body that may be the same. When Jesus returned and after he rose from the dead, he still had the scars in his hands and he still had the scars on his body. But yet they did not recognize it because he was not the same in his body, not completely. And so he says, when we see him, we will be like him. We will be as he is. We have to see the vision. We have to see the future. We have to look past the problems. We have to look past our aspirations and our goals here on earth. And we have to realize that this is passing away. Yeah. This is going to pass away so quickly and so fast when we realize that it has just gone. We're going to be amazed at how fast it went. And then when we stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, this is the judgment of the righteous. When we stand before him, I believe that there's going to be so very many...
that are just going to be so ashamed. Yeah. And look, I am not trying to put guilt on anybody or make anyone feel bad, but it's just the truth. There will be many standing before him justified. I'm talking about saved people, but they're going to hang their heads in shame. And they're going to be, my God, I wish I could just go pray a little bit longer. Come on. I wish I could get back to my job and tell some more people about Jesus. I wish I could have a do-over on this. Yes. Because this cardboard crown that he's bringing over, I mean, I don't know if it's going to last very long. It's probably about to catch on fire in the hot, hot presence of the Lord. I want him to present to me a crown that is chock-a-block full, loaded of jewels and diamonds and rubies and all Amen. kinds of beautiful things that represent what Jesus Christ did for me and the yield that he got out of me. The yes. yield, <coughs> the surrender that he got out of me. And, and the complicit uh, submission that he got out of yes. me so that I can take that same crown just like those 24 elders and I can cast it right back at his Amen. feet. Because everything that he presents us on that day, it will be a reflection of what he did and how we yielded to what he did. Praise God. How we yielded to what he did. Praise Who it, gets brother. a job? Who gets a job in this world and wants to stay at the bottom? I've heard so many people say, I, I can't stop using this example, but there's a guy I work with offshore. He doesn't come to the Bible studies. But hey, I, I've said it before. I take the Bible study to them where they are. You know, we'll talk about Jesus there. And so we were talking and he said, man, you know, I just got to, I just want to make it. As long as I just make it, I don't care if I'm just patching up the streets of gold. If that's my job, just patching up the streets, whatever that means, I, I'm not sure, but I mean, that was his perspective, that he just wanted to just make it in. Who starts a job and just wants to be entry level for the rest of their life? Come on, brother. Who wants that? We're talking about eternity. Yeah. What do you want for eternity? How do you want to spend eternity? Do you want to bring honor to the king of Amen. the earth, to the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Do you want to give him the, the, the life that represents a life that was yielded and surrendered, a life that was completely handed over to him for his service, for what he wanted, for what he wanted to get out of us. Thank you, Jesus. First Corinthians 2 9 says, eye has not seen, ear has not yes. heard, neither has it even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. We cannot even imagine. I've used this before also. You know, the song from, I believe it's from that goofy Disney cartoon, Aladdin. It's a whole new world. They're singing that song about how it's going to be a whole, it's a whole new world. That's foolishness. That's fairy tale. This is reality. It will be a whole new world. He's talking about it right there in the scripture. You cannot even imagine what it's going to be like. You have no idea, Amen. not just how the new earth is going to be like, but heaven when we are done with the thousand years and he eventually takes us to heaven to spend the rest of eternity with him. What is that going to be like? Right. It's going to be amazing. Amen. And then John 14 verses three through four, he talks about if I go and I prepare a place, don't you know I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you is what the gist of it is. I'm going to come back. And I'm going to get you. I'll just go ahead. I'll turn there. Thank you, Jesus. So John 14, 3 through 4. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Amen. We cannot even imagine. We cannot even imagine. Look, it's not just young people nowadays, but it's, it's, it's just about everybody. Every age group you can imagine is out there and they're going to psychics and they're going to get their fortune told, fortune telling and tarot card reading and, and all kinds of things like that. And they're, they're hungry to know what the future holds. They're hungry for the supernatural. And, and right here, 
in the presence of God, in the family of God. It's all right here. And right here in the word of God, he's telling us what the future holds. He's telling us. Why is it that we have to fight the fight of faith? Why is it that it's so important for us to stay connected to what Christ has done for us? Why is it? It's because of what is coming. The cross was to connect us to the Father. The cross was to connect us to eternity with Him. The cross's intention is to make us right with God. What Adam messed up, Jesus Christ made right. Yeah. That is the purpose of it, is to bring us right back to Him. That is the purpose. That is it. Amen. As it was in the beginning, so will it be in the end. When he comes down with New Jerusalem on, on a, a brand new earth that has been burned up and recreated and made brand new, when all of that happens, it's going to be the restoration of a new earth to bring it back to the way it was in the beginning. Methuselah is the oldest recorded man in the Old Testament. He lived to be 969 years old. This is going to be a 1,000 year reign. They're talking about toddlers and children looking like, I mean, they're around for hundreds of years and they still look like toddlers and they still look like infants and children. We're talking about a completely different earth. We're talking about something that is not affected and infected by sin. Amen. It's going to be completely different. As it was in the beginning, so will it be in the end. In the beginning, he created a new earth. He created new heavens, the skies, the starry space. All of that was created brand new. In the end, he's going to do it again. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. We have to be focused and we have to be connected to what Christ has done for us. In the beginning, the first Adam, he named the animals. In the end, the last Adam is going to change the nature of the animals. He's going to change them. There will be no predators. There will be no praise. They're going to be in harmony. Isaiah chapter 11 tells us, Isaiah chapter 11, start with verse 6, tells us about that and how that's, what that's going to look like. In the beginning, there was a tree of life that was there. In the end, the same tree of life is going to be available. It's going to be accessible. He says the leaves from that tree is going to bring healing to the nations. So there still are going to be those who do not have a glorified body that will need healing, physical healing Amen. in their bodies. There still is going to be that element. That's why you would have children that will be growing, right? Because not everyone is going to be glorified. Where does all this come from? Like, where am I coming up with this? It's all in the Bible. It's all in the Scripture. Isaiah is chock-a-block full of this stuff. Yes. I know we don't hear a whole lot about it, but Jesus went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Yes. The Apostle Paul brought to us by revelation, by divine revelation from Jesus, the gospel of Christ. Look, we can't, we can't enter into the gospel of the kingdom. We can't enter into that without the gospel of Christ. But we have to understand that they all go together. Yes. This is a plan that's much bigger sometimes than what we realize. That's right. There's something much bigger, a much broader scope. And the thing is, we cannot, we will not participate in the kingdom. We will not be residents in that kingdom if we do not understand what Christ has done. If we do not embrace what Jesus did at the cross. If we do not get some sort, some level of spiritual victory in our life and shut down the sin factory. Come on, because there is a sinful nature. It's like a sin factory that just keeps wanting to produce. It keeps wanting to produce. But like the Apostle Paul told us in Romans chapter 7, it's like a man who is married or a woman who is married, her husband dies. Then she's free from that law. And the thing is, the relationship is dead with the sin nature. The sinful nature itself is still alive. It still is there. But we can put it to sleep. We can put it to sleep and make it neutral where it does not have to dominate. Why is it that you see sometimes even teachers or preachers can, can get into deep sin? It's because they have a sin nature just like we do. We all have a sinful nature. And just because we become born again doesn't mean it goes away. There's doctrine out there that teaches that when you get saved, you have no more problems, no more sickness. Oh, we don't want to say that we're sick. 
I'm just, I'm just not into the lies. I'm just not into that foolishness because the Bible doesn't teach that and the Bible doesn't say that. And the Bible does say that God called those things that be not as though they were. He never said Abraham called it. He said God called them. The only person who has the power with his mouth to call things into existence that don't exist is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. He is the only Amen. one who calls these things into existence. And Abraham believed what he called. Yeah. He just put faith in it. What man's job is to do is to just believe in it. Believe what he said. Believe that it is true. Are you waiting on a promise? Has God told you that he was going to do something? You're still waiting. You still haven't really seen it come to full fruition. God will do it. God will do it. He said he will do it. He is faithful to his promises. He is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. Adam and Eve were created perfect in the beginning. They were created perfect in the beginning. And in the end, when we're glorified, we will be recreated perfect. Amen. We are going to be brand new. We are not going to have a sinful nature. The struggle will finally be over forever, for eternity. We will never, ever have to worry about the pains whether it's physical or whether it's internal, none of that will matter anymore. He will have wiped away all the tears from our eyes, the book of Revelation tells us. All of that will be behind us. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to encourage you and, and, and build up your faith and, and remind you, some of you already know some of these things, but to put before you that, look, there is so much more on the other side of what we're, where we're at. Like, there is so much more to come. This is just a very short, small installment of what is to come. Let's just go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11. I was bound to preach on this eventually. It's one of my favorite topics. But because I, growing up in church, I'd never really heard anything about this. Why? It's the gospel. This is the gospel. Gospel is good news. Amen. Gospel is good news. Amen. The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Christ. It's all, it all goes together. It all goes together. All of it. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the kid. Talking about a young goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little boy will lead them. Mm. Now hold up. A little boy is going to lead a calf and a young lion. And then the fatling. We're talking about a little calf. And he says in verse 7, also the cow and the bear will graze. They're going to graze together. A cow and a bear. Mm. Have you ever heard of any such thing? No, sir. You just did. <laughs> and then it says their young will lie down together. So the young cow and the young bears are going to lay down together. They're going to, they're going to hang out. <laughs> and the lion will eat straw like an ox. A lion with the canine teeth, right? Yeah. Eating straw? What the word says. That's what the Word of God says. And then verse 8, I like this too. And the nursing child will play by the hole of a cobra. What's going on here? We need somebody to come in here and explain this. And the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. We're talking about snakes, right? They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. He's talking about Mount Zion. He's talking about a future time and a future place, a future earth. There it is. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Praise God. This is a picture that we need to grasp and we need to believe that this is truly coming because it is truly coming. Amen. It is going to happen. And we are going to participate in that. That's so good. You're going to be a part of that. You're going to be a part of that. And so there's other places in the New Testament. I believe Peter talks about how we're going to be kings and we're going to be priests. And that we're going to rule and we're going to reign with Christ. 
We're going to rule and we're going to reign with him. There's going to be other cities and other countries throughout the earth. And then Isaiah, the same prophet here, he talks about how these kings of these other nations are going to stream up Mount Zion. They're going to, they're going to flow up to him and they're going to bow down before him. Amen. And they will worship the king of the earth. And they will submit to his laws. And if they have not, he will lay down the smack down. That's my translation. Of it. He's going to lay the smack down, but it's there. He's going, to, he's going to correct. He's going to bring correction to it. And so the thing is, those of us who have truly come to a place to where there is a, a, a good healthy level of submission to God. I'm talking about a healthy level where you know that the power of the cross, the power of what Jesus Christ did for us is truly active and happening inside of you. And it's evident. It's going to be made known on judgment day. He's going to take all of our works and it's as if you could take all your works on judgment day, the judgment seat of Christ. Those who are truly born again. We have to talk about the other judgment too. That's the great white throne judgment. That's the ones who represent the goats in the parable that Jesus told. It represents those that are the wicked. They're going to be judged as well. But back to the righteous. When the righteous are standing before God on judgment day, it says that he's going to take all of their works. And it's almost, I'm just in my mind, just picturing like he takes them and he puts them in a pile together and he puts a flame to them. And he wants to see what is going to happen to those works when they're tested by fire. Mm. Some of it is going to burn up like okay. wood, like stubble, like hay. It's going to be consumed and there's not going to be much left. And then there's going to be others that's going to come out, the works that come out, that will be more like precious gold, yes. like precious metals. What he's judging is not just the what, come but he's judging the why. Mm. What did you do and why did Amen, you brother. do it? He's going to go deeper and deeper and deeper to the core issue of what was done and why it was done. You could be a... a it could be a best-selling book author that I mean, has the talent to write, and I mean a Christian book author that can write really well on the things of God. But God wants to know what was the reason that you wrote those books, you know. And I'm not trying to pick on book authors. I'm just using it as an example. What was the real reason? What was the real reason you wrote those books? Amen. This is what we have to look forward to. What do you want to do in eternity? You know, my daughter, when she, was, when she was in junior high, I started to ask her about what she wanted to do like in college, and, and she thought I was really crazy because I was just really, really advanced, like way ahead of the game on that. But I, was, I wanted to prepare her, like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And I'm asking you, what do you want to do for the kingdom of God? I just want to do whatever he wants me to do. I, I, look, I'm not trying to make this something that's not. But what I'm saying is, do you want to be used of God here, do you want to be used of God for eternity? We're, look, we're not going to be tired in eternity. We're not going to grow weary in eternity. We're not going to need a little bit of rest when we're in eternity. We're not going to need all that. All that's going to be gone. So the way you feel right now, don't let that affect your decision, okay? Don't let that affect your mindset. All that's gone in eternity. But what we do in the here and now, it does affect eternity. Not just whether we make it into heaven, whether we make it with God, but also what we will be used for and what we will do for him. Amen. It determines that as well. Don't lose sight. Don't lose sight. Hallelujah. Don't lose sight. Hallelujah. The king is coming. The king is coming. Mm. He is coming. Hallelujah. As it was in the beginning, so will it be in the end. If you would, please stand with me. The most important thing that could be discussed, the most important thing that could, could be mentioned this morning is really just what Jesus did, what he did for us. Why in the world was it so important? Why in the world was it so necessary for God to send Jesus Christ, his own 
Son to come and die for us. Some people struggle with the Trinity. Some people struggle to understand. And, and I've come to, when I was a kid, I struggled just, you know, just to wrap my head around it. Now it's like it's so simple to me. It's not a difficult concept. Three people, three persons, one unit, one God. You have husband and wife, two people, one marriage, one couple. It's that simple. So let's not make it more than what it is. But what God wants is God wants to make himself real to each and every one of us. He wants to make himself real. God wants us to know that we can have a blessed assurance. We can have a confidence. We can have a confidence knowing, knowing that we're born again. I like to talk to people when I talk about it. You know, I talk about that. I, I don't like to talk about getting saved or being saved because everyone thinks they're saved. Mm. I mean, have you noticed that? Yeah. Everyone seems to have the idea and think that they're saved. And I don't mean that in a judgmental way, but I've noticed a very different response when I talk to him about being born again. There was a guy, another guy on the <coughs> that I was talking to, and I was just telling him how the Lord blessed us, and uh, we were all excited. It was like, man, this one guy, you know, he went all the way offshore in the Gulf of Mexico to come to the platform to get saved, to receive Jesus. Praise God. He got saved, and so I'm sharing it with this other guy who I wasn't so sure what where he was really at, but who cares? Like, I'm just going to share it. You Amen. Know? I told him, I was talking to him about how he was born again, and then he, he stopped, and he went, and he sat down in a chair in the warehouse with me, and he said, you know, Aaron, he said, many, many years ago, I, I was at a church and they said I needed to be water baptized. And, and so I went and I got water baptized. And, and when I came out of the water, they, they told me I was saved. He said, am I born again? He said, what, what does it mean? What is born again? What is that? How that you? morning, I was scrolling through some messages that Chari had sent me. And I don't know how we were supposed to have a conversation when we were driving to Thibodeau to go visit and meet and, and have dinner with my daughter. But she had asked me, Mark 16, 16, I need you to, you know, give me an explanation. Give me your, your take on it. And that's the scripture where, G, where he's talking about um, Mark 16, 16. He who has believed and has been Yes, he who believes and is baptized. I said, thank you. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And so she was trying to wrap her head around it. And so thank God for the message of our new covenant, the message of the cross. Because Romans 6, I believe it's verse 4, it talks about us being baptized into Christ. And we've spent a lot of time explaining that the word baptism does not equal water. <coughs> baptism equals immersion. Yeah. We have been immersed into something. Whatever it is that you're baptized into, it doesn't just always automatically mean water. We've been baptized into Christ. Yeah. And he who believes and is baptized into Christ will be saved. Right. And so I went and I studied it out, you know, and I prayed and I sought the Lord. And it was that same day that this man comes. And he sits down in the chair in the warehouse and he begins to ask me more about being born again and tell me his story about how he was water baptized and he was told that he was saved. And, and look, it's not our responsibility to tell somebody that they are saved or that they're not saved, right, but we right, sure right. better make sure that we try our best to make it as clear as possible yes. as to what is necessary right. to be saved, yes. to be born again. And so we, we talked, you know, and, and, and I explained it to him. And it was a really good response that, that I got from him. I, I don't know exactly where he is with that, you know, but, but praise God. The Lord will use us if we'll make ourselves available. Yes. The Lord will use us if we'll make ourselves available. I want to encourage you. Look, this is what you have to believe. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You have to believe that He is God. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is came down from heaven and he came to earth in the flesh. And you have to believe that Jesus Christ was the remedy for your condition, yes. your sinful, lost, wayward condition. You have to believe that not just Jesus the person only, but what Jesus the person did, I'm talking about the finished work 
of what he did when he went up to Calvary. He was crucified. He was beaten bloody. He was beaten bloody for us. He took the pain and he took the sorrow. He took the suffering upon himself. And he took the penalty and he took the guilt and the shame of our wickedness and our sinfulness. Not to condemn us, but to set us free. We have to believe that that is the answer. We have to believe that there is no other way. We have to believe and we have to confess that as a demonstration of our faith. And then there's repentance where we turn around and we turn away from the old way, the old lifestyle. And he wants us to confess our sins. John tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to cleanse us and to forgive us from all unrighteousness. And this is an ongoing thing. As we sin, we confess. As we sin, we confess to the Lord. We give it back to the Lord. We let Him continue to wash us and we let Him continue to cleanse our conscience and to keep us pure and keep us holy before Him. When Jesus appeared to the disciples, when He rose from the dead and He appeared to the disciples, there was one of the settings that He was with them and He told them, He said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And He breathed on them. And they received, I believe that's when they became born again. That was before they went to the upper room and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But I believe that's when they actually became born again. That's just my personal thoughts on that. It's interesting because when God breathes on the righteous, they're given life. But then there's places in the Old Testament where he talks about how the breath of the Lord destroys the wicked. Someone who's not looking for God, someone who's not seeking God, someone who's fighting against God, it brings death and it brings destruction. And what God wants you to know is that God, when he comes back to this earth, he is not only going to take up the saints, he's not only going to bring up the, those who have died in Christ to meet him in the air, but he's also going to finish what still needs to be completed. He's going to pour out his wrath on this whole earth. He's going to pour it out. He's going to sound out the trumpets of his wrath. He's going to pour out the vials or the bowls of his wrath on this whole earth. And every inhabitant that does not know the Lord, that is not consecrated and committed to the Lord, will be affected. Many will be destroyed by it. And right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just pray right now. For those who need Jesus, if you don't know him, if you're not 100% sure that you're right with him, if you don't have that confidence, if you don't know that you know that you know that you know that if you would die right now, that if he would take you, if you're not sure that you would go to be with the Lord, you need to confess him right now. If you need prayer this morning, come on up to the front and we'll pray with you.